Fright Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Stuff, currently getting some stuff back and going, rebuilding his career. Um, you will be able to catch me and my cohort. I'm trying to think of this there sometime. Yeah, should. Um, we are going to be crossing blades yet again. Yes. At the Missouri Romance Writers Association, covering writing the fight scene and sword fighting. Um, this time we've been talking about using lightsabers. So, yes. never know. We'll see who really is the Sith of the two of us. And, you already uh, know. <laughs> thank you, Tree. Just try to ruin it for everybody. <laughs> you know, here I am trying to pass myself off as a good guy. But They're anyway. both Sith. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I might, you know. You know, I resemble that bad. remark. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and on that <laughs> note, for my lovely co host who just declared me a Sith. Both of you are Sith. You're Sith together. Hi, uh, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. Yeah. I write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and my short story, You Will Always Have Family, a triptych, will be out in Nightmare Magazine in March. It's going to be under my name, though, not the romance name. Yay! Yay! Yay. 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 That's awesome. And with us also today is... Uh, Brad R. Cook, author of many, many things. Um, But the things you can go read are uh, Iron Horseman... Iron Zulu, and now Iron Lotus is out. Do check it out. Um, you can actually find it's uh, running around a couple of blogs actually right now if you want to read more about it or read the first chapter. Uh, so, you know, Google Iron Lotus and it should pop up. Um, yeah, cool. That's me. And back, to, back, from, <laughs> back from being kidnapped by the nursing school and so forth. Uh, Lee Savage. I have another whole week of break left before I'm back to the grind. Uh, I write erotica for the truly wicked and under the pen name Carrie Lee Williams. I also have my innocent children books. <laughs> and, you know, every time you say that, I, like, I know they're completely different, but trying to see how those two are done by the same author is amazing. She's schizophrenic. She must be. She's the one many right, talents. Yeah. Yes. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I am here, for, fresh from trying to almost finish the revisions on my novel. I have a page and a half worth of notes left to do, oh, and I'm horribly frustrated that it's not done yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it will be done by uh, by March 25th when I have my launch party in Main Street Books in St. Charles. Yay. So please, yay, yay, yay. Yay. Come to the Threadcaster launch party on March You 25th. can see the finish line. It's right there. I yeah. know. That's why I'm so bitter. <laughs> this is hug and push forward. Okay. <laughs> I'm Melanie Lucas, um, erstwhile author of uh, <laughs> science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. Lately, I have been getting over uh, illness and uh, working on the house and doing everything but writing. So maybe at some point I'll get back to it. I'll get her back to it. Yeah. I promise. Life like intervenes. This month, yes. Yeah. Fedora Amos, I write a Victorian who does like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West, and I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime again. Yay! <laughs> they, they kidnapped you into yeah. that one. It's right. funny how that works. Right. <laughs> yes. Excited for a little bit, and it's like, yeah. oh, okay. You know, being president of the St. Louis Writers Guild, about now, what, a thousand times I start looking for successors, and right now, knowing the only people who would ever want it. And who can do the job right now is, hi, Brad, how you doing? And I got to figure out, I know he doesn't want it again, so I'll still got to think about that. I am uh, George Soroy. I'm the vice president of the Missouri Writers Guild. I look forward to seeing you all at the Missouri Writers Guild Conference, (laughs) May 5th through the 7th at the Holiday and Executive Center in Columbia, Missouri. I also write science fiction for the young adult reader, uh, both of uh, 
both of my Excelsior books, Excelsior and the upcoming Ever Upward Part 2 of the Excelsior Journey, will be released later this year through Aloris Publishing, and my five-part serial from Parts Unknown will be released under my own banner uh, later this year. And I am Chanel Etienne. I am just a lowly writer of science fiction and fantasy. Lowly whatever. Like, that was a lowly. Oh, you mean yeah. like lowly, lowly like gothic lowly? Cool. That's yes, that is true. You're a member now of the right pack. There's no lowly love. <laughs> okay, and today we're going to talk about, oh, before I do that though, since George mentioned the um, Missouri Writers Guild Writers Conference, please also remember Gateway Con for more information on the normal ad. As you always hear at the end, it is going to be at the end, but it is the weekend of June 16th, 17th, 18th? Yes. Thank you. I always get my dates. Eh. But anyway, uh, Writers Conference and Readers Convention. Registration is now open. Registration is open. Get on, please. And All the right. location is? The location is going to be at the Renaissance Hotel in St. Louis, which is right next door to the airport and local to, for if you are local and you want to do public transportation, you couldn't ask for better. So, with that, today we're going to talk about acting out a character and bringing, it, bringing forth a writer's voice to life. Being, basically, acting out your characters. This is why, personally, Dragon, as good as a system as it is... And what is Dragon? Well, hang on. <laughs> Let me finish. I, I, it was mid-sentence. Okay. This is what, let me take two on that. Why Dragon hates me. Why it does not like me. Dragon, for those who may not know what it is, is a voice recognition software that allows you to go from voice to type, or voice to text, types as you talk. And when I'm trying to come up with a different character voice, I just really can't, it really hates me, because normally it wants me to continue talking like this. Not like this at all! So... Yeah. Mickey Mouse isn't one of your stories? <laughs> <laughs> actually, I mean, actually, I have been known to do Mickey, not necessarily the story, but he sounds like he's got a five-day-old beard and not exactly a guy you want to hang out with. So I am not going to do any Mickey in invitations beyond what you just heard here on the mic. We'll talk after the mic. Go for it. Don't worry, we'll record that. So it sounds like you um, will do voices for your characters sometimes. I know that... Jennifer will draw her characters to kind of get more into their heads and their bodies. Um, personally, I will sometimes like try out a movement to get a handle on how to describe it or how it actually feels. What about the rest of you? Do you guys like act out things that your characters do or try and get a voice in your head for them? Um, abs yeah, absolutely. That's uh, one of the fun things that that um, that I like to do when it comes to. Uh, when it came to recording the audiobook for Excelsior, was figuring out you know like what each character is going to sound like, and in a lot of cases it was basically just like okay, what kind of voices can I do, mm -hmm. and what can I apply to that specific character? Um, so you know like I would just keep an eye on like different um, different characters that I can kind of do a decent impression of, but then just kind of tweaking to my own. You know, like one of my favorites was. Um, my character Nocturar from the first Excelsior book, that I basically just adopted the some you know the somewhat decent impression that I can do of Pinhead from Hellraiser, <laughs> and just took that and ran with it. You know, and, and so <laughs> if anyone else wants to try that, I specific I definitely would say like bad impressions of you know celebrities or you know like characters that you know of will definitely get you some some of the way there. Don't make every character Jack Nicholson though. It's transparent. No. Oh god, no. Yeah, you don't. You don't. You want to save like your Christopher Walken for like, oh, for god. something else. Party yeah. drops. Yeah, save that for parties. Yeah. I, I guess I'm going to add. I'll go ahead with Brad first. But no, go ahead and add to that. I was going to say one th one of the reasons why I change my voices when I'm when I'm writing. Not so much when I'm. I haven't done it to the book. I haven't done the audio book, audio book yet. But one of the reasons why is. If I change my voice, I put myself into that character's mindset. If I'm writing as David Allen Lucas, my voice, as you are hearing it here, I have a certain level of education and so forth, a certain background. If I want to change that, then I try and change how that voice sounds to me. And I won't necessarily imitate a, thing, a certain actor or anything else. What I will sometimes do is go on YouTube 
and look for people who look like they may be fitting what I'm trying to fit, and then I started listening, and that voice is, I try to pick up on their nuances, and I incorporate that into my voice, and I will literally say the dialogue out loud and type it as I'm hearing it. How do you find YouTube videos searching for specific people without ending up with a lot of questionable search history? <laughs> That's the hard part. I didn't figure out the questionable part. It's like um, you're looking for a uh, young adult Norwegian female. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to find some uh, things you don't want to find for your writing. They don't usually come up on the YouTube part, but... <laughs> yeah, YouTube YouTube should be keep your safe that. search on, <laughs> and you'll and yeah. that'll get you halfway there. Yeah. So. <laughs> Allow us to introduce you to the world of deleting your browser. <laughs> <laughs> you can always go into private mode. Private mode. There yes. you go. Yeah. There is that too. Um, <laughs> I, I, the NSA is not bothering me. They already figured out I'm a mystery writer because otherwise I'd be arrested by now. So, <laughs> Brad, did you have your something? Then? Well, uh, so I was going to answer your question actually. Um, they're, they're <laughs> Kathleen, it doesn't help if I point at you, sorry. No. Um, <laughs> so get used to this radio thing. You've only um, been doing it for three years. I know. So, uh, I as well, like, okay, so Disney animators, when they show them working, uh -huh. uh, when they're animating, they're often sitting there drawing here, and there's a mirror here. So that they can act out the facial expression that they want to put into, you know, the movie. So that they can get it just right. You know, the little nuances of the eyes and the curls of our skin and all that kind of weird stuff. They also have an acting one. They do. Um, so I, I, I kind of imagine it being that level in my head. That when uh, everyone in my book has... Uh, I don't want to say an actor comparison because it's not like I pick Brad Pitt or something crazy like that to be the leads of my book. It's not like that. Although he does have a nice first name. He does, Brad. yes. <laughs> Um, he stole it from Brad. <laughs> Sadly, he's older. I stole it from him. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the point being is that it's more of an amalgamation of different people, different things that I want out of certain characters. I often go off movies. You're looking for videos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'll take some actor's portrayal from some movie that I remember where they had something about that character that I want, and I'll watch that movie, and then I'll start writing that character or something along those lines. So that is often. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, just kind of dovetail off of what uh, Brad was talking about, I recently saw a uh, featurette for Finding Dory, and one of the things that they started doing is recording, um, video recording, actors um, actors do uh, recording their lines. Yeah. And basically, what they do is they'll, the animators will take the facial features that, or you know, like different things that they'll do while they're in in the recording booth. And apply that to the different characters. They've yeah. been doing that all the way down the line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But like they've they've really been you know, like really kind of pushing that lately. So Cause, well, Tom that's because they're trying Aladdin. to get back Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah Tom Cruise is Aladdin, and uh, why would you ruin that for oh, me? Uh, no, uh, he's not not the actor. No, like, he's not doing the voice. No, 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 no. That's the boyfriend from Full House. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. No, no, they, they take certain <laughs> uh, Alyssa Milano is somebody too. The um. Uh, when you watch the first Transformers movie, the 2007 Transformers movie, uh, Liam Neeson is Optimus Prime. Like, they watched footage of him for his body language. And uh, uh, Michael J. Fox is Marty McFly is Bumblebee. So they watched Back to the fun. Future. I can see reference for him. Yeah. Well, so. yeah. Okay, Fedora, you're going to follow up with that one. I don't know how. But go ahead. Oh, I'm not going to. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is say that I have a background in speech and theater. Uh -huh. So, of course, I do not act act on my characters at all. <laughs> what I do, though, in order to entertain my critique group, is when <laughs> I read aloud, I do uh -huh. character voices. And I get a test, then, as to whether they're actually working. Because my critique group will either like it or they won't like it, or they say, You screwed up on that voice. It wasn't the same as the one you did earlier. <laughs> so, so I just have a good time with it, and I think I get something out of the review of it rather more than when I'm sitting down at the computer. I don't think about it at all. <laughs> Uh, to answer Kathleen's, uh, I also like to sketch out my characters or either find pictures online of someone that looks like uh, my character and have that handy. 
Um, I'll even label it like this is this character. I like to find pictures of certain outfits as well um, as uh, to describe and put in um, voices I don't think about a whole lot, but I like to listen to music that conveys the theme sometimes and Very use that so. to create the emotion. And one of my favorite ones to listen to is the Queen of the Dam soundtrack. Oh, that's nice. a good one. Why I'm oh, writing, yeah. is, nice. especially when I'm writing my paranormal stuff. I And I will sometimes go back and watch some of the older vampire movies to just get in the mood to want to start writing the vampire stuff. And then I'm like, oh, like, okay. I'm ready now. Can so I definitely not the children's books. Second no. that recommendation <laughs> for the Queen of the Dam soundtrack. Yes. Oh, yeah. I found Kidney Thieves through that. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I was going to interject and say that's like Kathleen's turn next, but since you said that real fast. Um, I just, this last weekend, I got to hear the voice actor name. I can't, uh, Matt. Uh, something. Uh, Dotson, Matt Dotson. Yeah. And he did, if you don't know who he is, which is fair. Was voice actors are of the unsung heroes. Uh, his first acting role was Salacious Crumb. <laughs> by Jabba the Hutt. The little, the little monkey, oh, Iraq guy. looking guy. <laughs> that was his very first one. And he's done gremlins, he's done other creatures, and he's, apparently a, he's the voice over for Come Visit, Explore St. Louis, an, oh. an ad that's out there. And I think he makes his living doing this. And that was funny that he started off. Doing that after being, he was a carpenter at Skywalker carpenter. Ranch at the yeah. time. He was a carpenter at Skywalker Ranch. Then Bert had and heard him doing Popeye as he was pulling, <laughs> pulling work there. And anyway, but it's kind of funny that you said that because he was talking about one of the actors said on the game Dia Diablo, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. and he was having to record his voice at that time. I know this is not writing, but it goes with what Lee was just saying. And he was doing, he did a great job, he, when he was trying to record it, he's sitting in his room, beautiful day outside, spring day, everything else, he couldn't do it. So he put up black curtains to black it all out, turned on funeral music, mm -hmm. and eventually he could get the voices that he needed out. Gotta get that mindset going. You gotta get going. the mindset yeah. going. So music does, very critical to this. Go ahead. Did you guys want to continue the same thread? Because I'm going to change it a little bit. Okay, then yes. whoever wants to continue it. Oh, okay. Um, I was just going to say I get you 100,000% on the music. I generally have um, soundtracks in my head for various uh, projects that I'm working on. Um, one of the things that I found that was surprisingly helpful was um, Lord of the Rings soundtracks, mm -hmm. especially for yes. like great adventure music. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> totally there. But one other thing that I do is kind of moving along the same lines as you. Um, I also obsessively find... Um, pictures to that kind of make a composite sketch of like the characters I'm working on. I also tend to have like little Pinterest aesthetic boards for the characters where it's like this character feels like sparkles on a, on a black starry sky type thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just works. And this one feels like ratty old converse. It, it, and I just have all of them compiled together um, to make this sort of round character aesthetic for me. Yeah, I, I can, I can, I'm definitely with, both of you on both the music and um, and the the uh, Pinterest. When it, for me, like what uh, what I'll do is I will go ahead and basically raid my score album and base and put together a playlist. You uh, that basically takes the story from start to finish. Um, I found that for Ever Upward, if anyone is wondering, the a lot of the music that I used was from a lot of the Harry Potter's actually, like uh, from Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire. And a really good amount from Half Blood Prince. There was a whole lot from there that uh, that was really that really surprised me how much I enjoyed that. And um, when Excelsior was first released in its self published form, um, I put together a casting call Pinterest board and put the word out to people to say like, okay, who do you see as these different characters? And I got a lot of really good feedback from that. Oh, nice. um, so this is something that I I plan on uh, continuing. Um, especially, especially at the end of this month, once my newsletter goes back up. But uh, yeah, definitely helps for interaction. Right. Cool. Um, so I also enjoy the music, but I'm not a purist at heart when it comes to this. So you know, everyone. I mean, everyone I know creates playlists, um, and you know, has like their favorite scores that they write to. And I'm actually not like that. I will write to, you know, EDM one night. I'll write to the blues another night. 
I'll write to the oldies like Otis Redding or Patsy Cline or some crazy stuff like that another yes. night. Um, and, it, you know, it can be, but what I tend to find is that the same book, like, has similar genres that I'll, you know, tend to listen to more. And that might just be what I'm feeling at the moment. Um, but it also tends to go per book. So it could just be that's just the vibe I'm feeling while I'm writing that book or whatever. Um, but I do enjoy music while I write because it helps me get my fingers moving faster and things like that. Um, so I, I do love the music. But I was going to say, uh, I've kind of talked about this a little bit in past episodes, but every book that I write is a movie. So it's a movie in my head. It's how I think. It's how I feel. It's how my inner mind sees everything. So when it comes to betraying everything, when it comes to seeing Alexander or seeing Captain Baldrick, um, you know, I, the, uh, these people are very clear in my head. I, I know them in and out. I know what they look like, 360 degrees around them. Um, but the one of the more interesting things is, in my mind, it's animated. I tend to think in animation. Oh, um, sometimes I think in live action. Sometimes I think in this weird crossover between the two, thinking back to the weird stuff in the like 70s and stuff <laughs> uh, that they were doing with like where they'd mix animation and real film together. Uh, but yeah, so Roger Rabbit. <laughs> that wasn't the 70s. That no, 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 more <laughs> like uh, <laughs> Black <laughs> Cauldron and uh, rotoscoping. Yeah, rotoscoping. Thank yeah. you. Rotoscoping yes, yes, yes. is the art of. Uh, Shooting it on film first, and yes. then when you're drawing, you either copy one to one or you actually physically trace the yep, frames yep, of the yep, live yep. action. So, like what it's, they did with heavy metal. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, there's it's a lot got of a, scoping It's in got there. a definite yeah. feel to it because animation, when you're drawing just animation, it you know you can change the timing and sort of yes. the weight and whatever, mm -hmm. and it makes the things that are rotoscoped feel really stiff and lifeless because you're lacking what the rest of the world has, mm -hmm. which is a sort of freedom to break from the mold. That's why when you're watching. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, Snow White looks a little bit like a mall mannequin compared to all the dwarves. <laughs> it's because she's rotoscoped and they're not. Oh. But yeah, so the point being is that when I, you know, when I'm sitting down to write something, I know things like what the character sounds like, what they are, you know, what they smell like, what the world is, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and then for me, it's about trying to impart what I see onto the page. And I think that's one of the reasons why I tend to write linearly, you know, in a linear fashion. Uh -huh. I think it's why my character arcs tend to go the way they do. It's just the way I think when I see the stories that I want to tell. I would, do, I do pretty much the same thing, and I will say that not everybody uses music. I like silence. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and silence would put me to sleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know me. I'm too ADD. I'm too. So anyway, swirl. Um, Heck, I like the TV too. Yep. Some bad program. Oh. That's <laughs> oh. TV, TV is my... You like enemy. noise? Yeah, noise. white noise in the background. Yeah. We're very similar, Brad. I, but, I like to put on YouTube videos and stuff. Yeah. Things that I know I don't care about. But oh, I love a video human, channel for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that human sounds. Plus, then I have the added benefit of I know what all the teenagers are listening to that day. <laughs> <laughs> but one, two things I find with, write, with my writing is one... I change music genre based upon the book I'm writing. So in other words, one writing sci-fi. I've got a whole bunch of science fiction, um, film scores, and TV show scores, as well as like two, two, two Steps from Hell, immediate music, etc. When I write my crime, is jazz and dark jazz and jazz noir and all that. Even um, uh, what's called gangsta grass, which is which is basically rap and meets um, bluegrass. Well, you're soundtracking your story. I'm sound yeah. No, but soundtracking my your genre. soundtracking my mind, yeah, my yeah. genre. Um, and and that makes sense. I yeah. mean, that, that that makes sense. You're you're setting a mood, right? You know, and nothing and wrong I, with that. Exactly. And I also old style DMX type rap mm -hmm. um, into the DMX. into the murder mystery stuff. Old style. Uh, yeah, old school. Yeah, I'm sorry. You say old school, and suddenly I, I, I'm thinking way older than you. Right, I'm <laughs> old school rap. Anyway, um, Farther back than that. Yeah. But on top of that, though, let's get back to characters. Is if I can't see a character clearly, for some reason, I think what music fits to. And and once again, it's a mystery. What kind of jazz is this guy? Is he the dark jazz? Is he kind of the light instrumental, is he got the soulful woman singing his theme? What is it? And I'll start listening to that so I get the idea of what is what he and I'm saying he being English, you know, there's no 
neutral gender word, so female, male, doesn't matter. They is appropriate now. Yes, it is. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still, I'm still in it, drunken white world. Audience, they is appropriate now. It's in the uh, dictionary. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's fine. Anyway, uh, but yeah, trying to match the music to fit the character. Go ahead. Um, this isn't the point that I wanted to bring up, but actually, I, I've noticed a theme a bunch of us use music to kind of uh, create a mood to get us in the in the story world or uh in david's case the the character what what they feel like when he writes them but does anybody like figure out what kind of music their character would listen to and kind of immerse themselves in that kind of thing to get into their character's heads i have done this in the past so i used to write with a i used to have a writing partner um who believed in playlists for every character in the book like the major character and they were writing a couple of characters in a book and so whenever that chapter came up that they had to write they would listen to that character's playlists um, so I tried to create playlists for my characters I found it odd um, <laughs> awfully pudding and um, in the end it really was just a bunch of songs that I enjoyed that <laughs> I was kind of listening to like I probably didn't do it in the way that you know would be helpful to many many people I'm sure but yeah, so I you know, and I tried to think of what the character themselves would be listening to, but I did not find it was the most fitting. But then I don't write to set a mood for myself, or I don't listen to music to set a mood for myself. Um, I listen to music to uh, kind of get my body moving faster than it would be if I were just sitting there. And you're 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 using it for pacing. Pacing's one this thing. Is, I don't mean story detail. Distraction. Story detail your pacing. When I'm singing back here in like, you know, whatever part of my life I'm using to, to sing, the other part gets to write and has no problems writing, you know. It's for all those reasons. Okay. He has um, a bifurcated brain, is that what you're saying? Well, I'll, I'll be, like, sometimes when you're singing, like, you know, I'll be singing along to a song that I've known for more years than I'll do too. And, you know, when I'm doing that, suddenly when I'm typing, just becomes second nature and I'm going through the scene and... Yeah. My subconscious and I work a lot together. Yeah, when I need to dig out the music, when I need to dig out the words, it's also on the pop, it's also on Battlestar Galactica Apocalypse, the live version. And I will put that on loop. And it goes. Go for it. To, uh, to answer Kathleen's question, one of the things that I did when I had written the original novel version of From Parts Unknown back in 2001, 2002, um, I did something similar to that because this it's based around the world of the uh, much more evolved version of professional wrestling. And so basically what I did was I said it in the storyline that, um, that uh, the government has changed uh, the specific copyright laws so now the, you know, the promotion can use whatever, whatever music they want for their characters um, for the character's entrance theme. When they come in, so that was that was a lot of fun for me. Was for uh, basically looking out to you know like all the different type of music that was out there these days, and just like all right, well, which which song would fit this character? And so what I wound up doing was for my main guy, um, my uh, current champion Kyle Flight, I at I had him come out to Foo Fighters, My Hero. For um, for my main bad guy for Vornikai, I had him coming out to Rob Zombie, Scum of the Earth. And just basically just had a lot of fun just picking and choosing like okay these char- this character would go with this song this character would go with this song very much in the style of what ECW would do by using um, by using songs that are out there right now as theirs. Nobody picked the Imperial Death March. <laughs> no, no uh, that I didn't want. Uh, I didn't want to touch. I didn't want to touch John Williams out of respect for John Williams. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be so cool for yep. the villain of the wrestling match. Um, so I want to steer the conversation back to like literally acting as your uh-huh. character. Um, while I was at Clarion, um, Ellen Kushner brought in a woman who teaches improv and acting. And uh, the woman had, like, I don't remember her name, which I feel awful about. I tried to find it for the episode um, and failed. So she had us all think of a character that we were writing in a story of ours. And then she had us stand with our eyes closed 
and become the character from the feet up. Think about how they carried their weight on their feet, like how they, they placed their hips, just the way that they would walk, what they would stress in their body. And it was really, really cool because I found out that my center of gravity was different from the character that I was thinking about. <laughs> like, it's a dude. Like, he com carries himself completely differently. And it was something I would not have thought about when writing that character because I hadn't embodied him yet. So that was part one. Part two, we had to do, uh, we had to continue with our eyes closed and come up with a different position to embody the inner life of the character. Mm. The character I was doing was a gunslinger. Nice. He, uh, the amount of care that he gives to certain things is, is nil. And that was, care is not the word I meant. Um, he gives zero Fs about anything <laughs> and he carried himself that way but the inner life of the character is actually like a teddy bear and i was like horrified by this because <laughs> you don't have a gunslinger that actually wants friends you have someone who wants to be a loner and figuring that out i would never have been able to do without that whole exercise so then she had us morph from the one to the other and i learned a lot about the character that i never would have if we hadn't been acting as if we were that character as a sidebar, and I'm going to write to Brad's next. Brad is next. But since you talked about improv, if you are here in St. Louis, for, um, right back member, he's on, been on here a few yep. times, um, Bob Baker has improv classes on Thursday nights. That are really fun. You need to go, I, I need to get into them myself. And I'm, it's unfortunate I'm a right back writing night, and I don't like sacrificing that night. But it, it will help you as far as figuring out your characters, and if you're a voice actor doing voices. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, actually, um, I completely agree with this because um, I think a lot of acting exercises uh -huh. are wonderful ways if you need help exploring a character or something like that. These are great techniques that you can use. These are techniques that actors use to explore a character so that they can connect with every being of it and therefore portray them you know, as the way they should be. Um, it's a great thing. However, I would also say uh, that I write differently. So when I write plays, because I started off as a playwright, when I write a play, it is a completely different experience from when I write a novel. Um, I actually will more act out, straight out. I want to I wanna see how words, you know, how the cadence of a word comes out. Uh, it, it's things that you think about differently. Like when you're writing a play, you think about the way the words are going to be heard. I don't necessarily think about that when I'm writing a novel. You know, I, I care about the cadence I'm using in the actual mm -hmm. words that come through, but what I'm more caring about is the, the pace of the story that I'm telling and things of that nature as opposed to, you know, exactly how the words are going to sound when spoken aloud. Sometimes when my books are read, it's weird. Mm -hmm. um, but, a, but a play is different. A play is meant to be heard. A play is meant to, you know, is for the ear. Um, so, you'll, you know, I, I write much differently when I'm writing a play. Fedora and then Well, I think that you have a very good point in talking about uh, what the characters are doing, and I think it's invaluable to consider that, and I often find myself doing like, that, I, that was a stabbing motion, by the way. <laughs> the hair is standing here. <laughs> but I didn't have anybody to stab, unfortunately. No volunteers that I could see. But anyway, I think it's invaluable for creating dialogue tags because you can see what your characters are doing, but on the page... Yeah. You have to describe it somehow, yes. and dialogue tags will do that for you. They yeah. also break up your dialogue in nice ways, in nice little bites, and you don't have to keep saying he said, she said, because by what the character's actions are, people will know which character it is. So speaking of stabbing people... Oh. No, he did not I stab lean me back. <laughs> Victor, Victor Laval um, was also one of my teachers this summer, and he talked about embodying your character, like literally getting into their body and living experiences that your characters would have because you learn details when you're actually doing something that your character would do that you don't when you're just imagining what your character would do. So you weren't doing any serial killers, right? No, okay. um, but I will get to that. Okay. So, um, <laughs> She's about to confess to murder. Let her go. <laughs> I'm black. They were going to get me anyway. 
let's be real. So, like, wow. he, he does an exercise with some of his students where he um, has them write about lying out in the grass, and then he'll have them go outside and lie down in the grass, and then come back in and rewrite that paragraph. And inevitably, there are more details, and the second paragraphs are much more vivid because they have experienced this thing. Right. To the stabbing story. <laughs> uh so we already did have serial killer. Go ahead. So, um, I have stabbed something. I have stabbed a piece of meat. It was very thick, and I did it because I wanted to know what it was like to stab something. Uh-huh. And it was entertaining in that I was really not prepared to go all out and stab this thing, but I tried my best. And also, the knife stuck inside the thing and that's not something i ever would have thought about in a stabbing story mm-hmm. but having done that i can now you know have a victim die in a story much more easily with only a slightly unconscious like uncomfortable memory to guide me yeah. i should have stabbed it more that's what i got from that experience you only stabbed it once i know right i'm a horrible oh, writer <laughs> I yeah see i probably would have like dun, 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 dun. the person i was with did that <laughs> He was also male. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's there's an important difference right there. Go and then come back over to the um, I was just going to comment on the uh, improv and acting aspect uh, that ever, that some of the people here seem to bring to their writing. One of the things that I found um, from the acting classes that I've taken, one class, um, the uh, one exercise that you that I found that. Um, went hand in hand with acting and writing was that I literally just people watching because mm-hmm. like I would sit at the mall and because I didn't want to be creepy I'd face a mirror that that way people couldn't see me staring at them mm-hmm. and so you were being creepy you just weren't looking like you were being creepy. exactly perceptions all that matters here mm-hmm. um, good technique <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, I would just watch them and I would watch like the way they walk and then like co- create a backstory for this person in my head that like correlated to why they were walking that way, where they were going, what they were doing. And I would notice their little nuances like this person had a tendency to like flick her hair behind her shoulder when she was talking to somebody and this character did something else. And I would take those and I would transpose them onto my characters um, appropriately. But that's something that I learned from acting and writing. So they kind of relate for me. I have a suggestion for everybody who wants to write an action scene which involves any kind of fight, and that is baked bread. Yeast bread. <laughs> okay. Yeast bread. Yes. That is, let it rise up really good and then punch it down yeah. just as hard as you can. And you're not going to hurt yourself, at least not very bad on your knuckles. But if you do it over and over, you'll get a feeling in your shoulders and your hands and your arms of what it's like. I do believe you will. That's my suggestion. I tried that and I do believe it works. Yeah, that would probably work. You think it, you think it works, Brad? Yeah, no, you're using most of the same muscles there. I've, yeah. I've, I've kneaded bread much this way before. It's a fun... It's a very fun way of making bread. And not only that, <laughs> you feel good when it's done. You do. You release a little stress, you got some right. bread at the you end. You get rid it's of the good. stress and the rage. The goodness gracious, it feels good. stop doing the um, punching bag. And, okay. Yes. Do the bread. Don't do the bread. bread. The punching bag is completely bread. unnecessary if you're a baker. It doesn't work with gluten-free bread? Gluten-free bread doesn't rise. Oh, no. oh, that's right. Oh. That's terrible. Oh. Yeah, but it doesn't punch. I bet it doesn't Well, you just need to hit that regular mm-hmm. bread for kicking you in the butt, you know, gluten style. So <laughs> right. just yeah, get it back for its gluten that's yeah. in there. Be like, damn you, gluten. Wear rubber gloves. <laughs> or, not rubber gloves. It's, not, rubber it's, gloves. it's, it's and, and a mask. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, See, yes. it's possible. So a hazmat suit. You can kick some bread. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just I'm making a video of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, okay. Bread, were you doing? Yeah, so what I was going to talk about, um, so we've been kind of used talking about using experiences. Yeah, you know, you're talking about watching people, we've talked about other things, using these, and this is why I think writers need to be sponges. Yeah. Because when I'm living life, part of me is, yes, enjoying myself and, you know, having a, a good life so that when I die, I'm all happy. <laughs> um, but more importantly, I am absorbing the things around me. When I walk through nature and I'm hearing the crunch of what's going on underneath me, when I step in crap or some sort of mud or muck, I think about that suction force that's there and the you know how it's all there, because I know invariably some point down the road I am going to be writing this scene. Mm-hmm. So when I find myself in interesting places, locales, doing interesting <laughs> things, uh, this past spring I did some glass blowing. I had a blast doing it. 
No I love there. the experience. I was also sitting there. I asked a ton of questions, like way more than I probably should. In fact, it totally came out that I was a writer because he was like, why are you so interested in the history of glassmaking? <laughs> uh, but I'm like, you know, this is stuff I want to know about. I thought about the heat. You know, like, I would kind of, and I, when the heat was there, because the heat was intense, I mean, it was just, like, crazy. And I'm thinking about not only, like, how does this affect me, but I'm looking at, like, the area around, how it had kind of warped some of the metal and stuff that was right there at the edges of the ovens and stuff like that. And the reason I'm doing that is because at some point I'm writing a volcano scene mm -hmm. or some kind of, you know, fun craziness like that, some big, you know, huge fire that, you know, has engulfed the building that you're in. I know those scenes are somewhere down the line. So this is why I say that writers should be sponges. As you live your life, as you're you know going around, you're seeing all these things that then you can use when you write that scene, get the experiences that way instead of necessarily just having to live what you know. Well, okay, my 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 character is climbing a mountain today, so I'm going to go out and climb a mountain. Be you know? curious about everything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, um, also kind of play off of what Kathleen was talking about before about how. Um, how you did the improv, you know, like of your characters from the feet all the way up. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to doing is actually like narrating an audiobook inside the uh, the sound booth that is in produ that is uh, in progress over at my house because when I was recording Excelsior, I didn't have the I could not um, express my myself bodily like the way that you know the way that I wanted to for these characters because I had to basically just like. Set my set my microphone on top of several books that was on a you know that was on a TV tray, and then just lean over on my couch so that way it can get to like the best possible sound. So I couldn't move around the way that I can in a vocal booth. So I'm looking forward to being able to do what you were able to do and, and apply that stand. to those characters. Yeah, that's why most people stand in vocal booths. That's why yeah, that's why I recommend like anyone stands during a vocal booth because not only is it better for not only is it better for your posture, yes. <laughs> but it's also better for the sound. Like it, the the sound winds up coming out a lot, a lot better, a lot clearer. Yep. I'm not saying that that my book, you know, wasn't good. It wound up coming out as decent as I um, as I possibly could get it, and I think it wound up go, uh, going over well. So, but uh, but at the same time, being able to move around the way that you did, you know, like really goes a long way. Um. Jen, did you have yours? Or? No. Okay. I um, wrote a scene with two characters that were coming back from a jog. And um, it was okay. And then I walked my dogs and ended up jogging for part of it. And after I stopped jogging, suddenly I had all these sensations in my body that were missing from that scene. And I was like, oh, that's why it doesn't feel quite, re quite right. That's why it doesn't feel real enough. And I went back and I changed some of the dialogue and added in all the bodily sensations I was feeling, like in my feet and my, my calves and with the breathing. And that helped make the scene more realistic. Um, something else to do with walks, though, um, is I find when I'm really in a story, I'll start noticing things as my characters would notice those same things. So the first thought that comes to my head will be like, oh, oh, she would say this about that. Or like, this character would look at that and think this. And when that happens, I know I'm really, like, I've really got the character down. They're really distinct in my head. No? Yeah, I was in my, this is a complete turn. Uh, this is something I would do at the very early drafts when I'm still trying to figure out the story. Um, I give my characters, um, uh, I, I figure out what their psychological makeup is. This probably comes with having a bachelor's in psychology. <laughs> but um, a lot of times I don't think that the character necessarily, I, I figure out what's motivating the character. It's not necessarily what they think is motivating the character. But it's like, you know, this character doesn't trust anybody, has abandonment issues, whatever, so, so it's always going to be very suspicious, defensive, whatever. This character is very manipulative. So then I go in thinking, okay, how would, given where that character's mental state is, how would they react to people? What are their motivations? And then I put them in a scene with other characters, and I have them start talking, not knowing where the scene's going, which means most of this occurs in my head because most of it's junk. 
Mm -hmm. But every so often, especially when I start writing, it's like, wait a minute. And the characters are just talking back and forth to each other. It's like, well, this character would say that, then the natural thing would be for the other character to say whatever. And it's like, you know, this just isn't matching up. Either my psychology, they, either they don't have the psychological background I gave them, or the scene, they just wouldn't do what I think they need to do for the story because of their psychological makeup. Speaking of psychological makeup, um, Sir Ken Robinson has some awesome TED Talks, and one of the things he talks about in his uh, talk about education and what we are basically raising, raising children to be as far as um, the goals of school, he says that um, by the time kids get to college, they're completely disembodied. Like their entire life is basically in their heads. Their, their bodies are just ways of moving their brains around. And it's the only way I get through doctor's appointments. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. But like, it's true for me. I'm a black person with no rhythm as far as my body goes. <laughs> like I can do a beat with my mouth. If it's in my head, it works. But if it's my body, my hips will lie to you. They will lie so hard. So doing characters that ha that can dance, that's difficult for me. I have a character that can pop. I can't do that. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Can you pop? Yes. She's a dancer, by the by. She's <laughs> a great dancer. She's danced herself so hard, her body might fall apart on her in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, see, the, um, actually, to go off of what you said, the, that is the actual reason that I became a dance major, was because I didn't want my body just to be this meat sack that carried my brain around. Um, <laughs> like I wanted to have purpose in with the entire package. But um, to go off of that, in terms of characters, um, my characters do, I, I pay attention to how they move. Like, in, if there is a specific scene in which my characters are dancing, or there's a scene which, in which they're at a club, Who's on the side sideline? Does that fit their character? Who is actually dancing? Are they dancing well? Do they think they're dancing well? Like, are they that person that's in a like a three foot circumference of nothingness because they're thrashing around and everyone is afraid they're going to get their eye black? It just that I pay attention to my characters and how they move just because that's kind of my background. Are they geek dancing or like pop dancing or like hip hop dancing? All of the above, <laughs> and not all of it's good. Actually, some of it's terrible, and I love it. <laughs> but I can like, tell you which one of my characters are good and bad dancers. Really? Oh, heck yeah. I know which ones can move and can. I told you that. These are like my friends. Main character. You know which ones of your of friends can move, right? Main character of the Iron Can Alexander, Alexander dance? Can he dance? Yes. He Alexander can. can dance. Can he do like a Sicilian <laughs> dance, or can he like no, break it down? No, He's American. no, no, no. He, he, can, <laughs> he can bust down to the rhythms of the like, you know, stuff like that. But see, here's the thing. Genevieve less so. She can do the formal stuff, but not necessarily pop and lock it. I <laughs> pop and lock. Wow. But yeah, so, yeah, you know, I, can, I can tell you who on the crew of the Sparrowhawk can dance and who can. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> they should have a soul train line. Wherever they are, just have a spontaneous soul train line and prove this to everyone. Yeah, like if you got all your characters together in a giant dance party, where in the room would they be? And which one would be the well, instigator that got half the group drunk and then took them out? In so the yes. Story? In the first in the first book, there's a scene where everyone kind of has this low moment and we're on the airship and we're flying through the skies and everything like this. And they all start sitting around and I wanted to give kind of that low moment where you could kind of see the crew interacting and stuff like that, but people start busting out guitar, or there's a guitar that busts out, and somebody's, you know, banging on a barrel. So yeah, there's dancing probably going on in that room. I just didn't describe it as much. I think I might have, there might be a word or two, but I don't think so. But yeah, there's probably some dancing going on there. So so it's there, you know, like, and it's, it's things you think about, odd things you think about. So, I won't get terribly explicit, but because Lee is here, I feel like we also need to talk about dirty dancing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Breaking it down, nice and dirty and dance. There are certain things that when you write, mm -hmm. you might not have experience doing them, nope. so you need to do the closest approximation you can <laughs> you that too. you feel comfortable with <laughs> to be able to write that Private thing. Private Get Absolutely. yourself to a club and grind on a stranger today. Do it. <laughs> it will improve your life. <laughs> What if your character wouldn't grind on a stranger? So one just... of your characters would. One of them would. Everything them would. everything goes into the writing. This is true. No experience is wasted. No matter how horrifying you feel, 
having done this thing when the stranger's girlfriend comes up and kisses you in the face. Yes, actually that yeah. has Oh, never mind. Oh. Um, <laughs> Also, also getting if you're a man like who's like, advice, like, <laughs> be prepared for the fifth fight. I am not writing practice. your name in a bathroom <laughs> stall. Unless you go to certain clubs in which that's Excuse okay. Excuse me. You just need to be better than her man. It's good. <laughs> I'm taking no part of this. I am leaving it alone at that part. Okay. But the point is, again, like the closest you can get to experiencing something that is going yeah. on with your characters, uh-huh. the better your writing will be. Yes. yes. And uh, even like, even for, um, I've been doing research into BDSM. For future projects, um, there are ways you can find safe ways to go test that out, either watching or if you're brave enough to take part in some of it. And that way you can have firsthand knowledge of how to describe it. And you can also interview people that you do the can, things yeah. that you, you weren't comfortable doing yourself. But or now, do. with yeah. interviewing, you you I'm almost really need to uh, be a little bit part of the community for them to feel comfortable well, with right. you. I was talking more generally. Them, a lot of them are very cautious. Yes. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but once you've at least interjected yourself into that they know you're open-minded and you're not judgmental, they're so happy to sit down with you and explain how everything works and what's safe, what's not safe. And you will find so many good people. I took a photographer recently to an event because he's interested in looking into doing photography in the erotic field. And they were explaining to him, you know, these are what's safe, this is what's not safe. You know, um, if you've ever heard of the violet wand, they make beautiful, beautiful pictures they can because the different colors of light. They were going into explaining to them which gases create which color of light and everything. Mm-hmm. So you can find a wealth of knowledge. And to know, it doesn't have to be that type of subject. Whatever it is, you can find YouTubes videos, you can find groups online, you can find probably groups that are in your hometown to go and meet and talk with other people of that interest. Mm-hmm. I was a, I have a, so there's a movie out right now, or it's going to be on DVD soon, called Arrival, and it's mm-hmm. based off of a short story by Ted Chang called Story of Your Life. And the short story is beautiful. It is about a, um, it's from the point of view of a woman who, who's uh, talking to her daughter, basically. Cool. And uh, she feels very much like a real woman. She has concerns that only mothers would have about her child, and she feels authentic. Ted Chang does not have a wife or child, is very much a man, and has never been a woman with a child so is none of the things that his main character is. And one of the things that he did to basically get inside of her head was something I've heard writers do about a lot of different things. He took a bunch of women with children out to, to eat and he interviewed them and had them talk about things that were their concerns when they had kids, like from the pregnancy into, you know, the, the adult life of their child. And in doing that, he was really able to get into this character's head to the point where people were surprised that he had no kids because he very much embodied the woman that was his main character and the mother that was his main character. So um, we did talk about the dirty dancing aspect of interviewing people, but it's it's for all sorts of things. If you are not whatever it is that your character is as far as like race, gender, sex, ethnicity, you can still find those people, whether it's online or in person, and kind of learn from them what it is to write that experience. I think on that note, unless anyone else has anything to add, that's a great place to stop. So, I'm going to say tune in next week for yet another interesting story in the writing industry. Thank you for listening. Gateway Con? What is Gateway Con? The Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, brought to you by St. Louis Writers Guild, is a new, unique experience for writers looking for their work to be either traditionally published, independently published, self-published, or to further their writing career. Coming in June 2017, Gateway Con will provide opportunities for writers to pitch their work to agents, hone their craft regardless if it is genre fiction or nonfiction, and obtain expert critiques. Get to meet vendors and experts who can help your writing get attention. And all writers get 
get their work in front of their audience. Writers will get to network with agents, publishers, and others in your genre. Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention will be in St. Louis June 16th through the 18th, 2017. For more information, visit www.stlwritersguild.org or look for GatewayCon on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. GatewayCon, opening the gateway for writers to reach their readers. Did you know that Write Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books? your book services, your author services, or more. Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.